remember, you may be on DCTV right now. Hello. <laughs> How it's exciting. The answer, yes. Are these, are these for, what are we supposed to do with these? Should we write love notes? And yes. Send them to the crowd? You guys look fantastic. <laughs> You can put your phone number on that one for me. <laughs> I'm in Marriott room 270. No, I'm kidding! I am not! I am not! I love Ooh. it. Ooh. They're setting the mood for everyone. I so love it. to not be distracted by your beauty, they turn down the lights. Yeah! <laughs> well, let's get the ball rolling, shall we, fellas? Yeah! Awesome! We're gonna have Aaron and Sharon that are gonna have people in the hallways. Are they waving wildly in the back? Hey. Ladies first, if I may. But if, um, they're like little prairie dogs, they'll pop up. <laughs> well, so far I don't have anybody over here to ask questions. What the what? Guys, girl, well, that was your cue to ask the first question. line to ask a question. <laughs> sorry about that with the light stand. I couldn't see that there was no one behind you. I'm sorry. Sure. Aaron, do you have someone? Boxers are brief. Oh, we got someone. Oh, oh. Like a ninja, they spring out of nowhere. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming. You guys look awesome. Thank you look awesome. So, who was the first of you to read all the books, have all the knowledge of Batman, Gotham, all of it? Or did you come in and read this cold and go, yeah, I know this guy in the cape, bud. <laughs> I think it was Daniel. I think it was Daniel. I think it was before. Okay. I think it was B. Before Gotham, but Chris was actually a, a big comic book fan before he got on the show. I, I, I became a comic book because of the show. Are you okay? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little tired. <laughs> but I think I think it was Chris. It, it's true, it's me. Because I love comic books and all yeah. things comic booky. <laughs> Was there anyone that was like a full Marvel fan and they're like, oh no, DC. I, I also love Marvel. I actually love Marvel more than DC. Could you love oh. this? <laughs> I can see the deadline headline now. Chris Chuck fired from Gotham. Looking for a new Lucius Fox. <laughs> Fox. All right, ready to catch. <laughs> She's like, I've got it though, it's mine. Oh, I got it. It's yours, but she loves you, baby. Thank you. I love you too. Aaron? Yep. Hello, guys. Hey, what's up? I've had a chance to talk to Drew and Sean and David and Robin at Nashville's Walker Stalker. Hey, guys. Hey, it's good to see you again, homie. This question is for Chris Chaw, my brother. <laughs> Will Lucius Fox get some more screen time and get more stuff to do and see in the next season? Yeah. You, yes, you. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, they have found various ways thus far in the season to get more Lucius, more luscious Lucius. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The thing, so uh, you're gonna see more of me, and I and I hope you don't get sick of me. Thank you. Back I love the idea of a panel where no one asks questions and we just sit here because all just stare at us and we're staring here in a darkened room for 45 minutes, and then we walk off. We're like, that went pretty good. <laughs> Welcome to Tracking Con. We can always just talk to ourselves and they can listen in. <laughs> How's the house coming along, Robert? What's that? How's your new house coming along? Oh, it's really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. We painted the walls. Have you decided on the paint? <laughs> we haven't done this until somebody asks a gosh darn question. Well, I'm right up here, so. <laughs> it's from I'm Poison Ivy. It's like back in the walk a thon, or walk a fame, like a few hours ago, if you remember that. Oh, yes. 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 Yeah. Sean and Drew already heard us yesterday, but do you, what are your favorite moments when filming Gotham? We answered that yesterday, so I can go. 
Favorite moments of Philly? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so some of my favorite. Well, last season. Uh, uh, if you haven't seen season two, this is a spoiler. Uh, when I when I murdered my step siblings and served them to. Uh, Uh, that one, and then of course I, I have two, and then the other one was uh, the pier scene in the pilot right. with me and Jim Gordon, and that was a big, big moment for me in my life that I'll never forget. Oh, yeah. Melinda Clark, that's who you worked with in that scene. Oh, Melinda Clark She's is so beautiful. Jam, gorgeous, amazing. She played the stepmother. She was also a character in uh, the OC. The OC. So, yeah. Yeah. so she, had, she had been went back for, for a while. Ago. Julie Cooper. <laughs> Did you watch the OC? Are you serious? <laughs> You're too young for the OC. <laughs> you totally had a crush on Lisa Barton, didn't you? <laughs> moment. Dude, you don't have to hold on to the mic. I like the uh, mic, son. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite moment thus far has been with the one and only Sean Petsman. Uh, he, he was just coming from a con and we had to film six pages and we had a and we had to film it like in record time and it was definitely the most fun I've had in a while, actually. Thank so thank you, Sean, for blessing my life. Yeah. Well, Sean, how about yourself? Was there a favorite scene of yours? I, the one I just shot with Lucius, that you just talked about. Yeah. No, that was actually one of my favorite ones. Also, the, one of the point, the one of the Microphone. Oh, check out. Yeah, that's magical. magical. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So, so no, the other one was uh, the first time that we were that Master Bruce and I were out the manor, which is an absolute relief, as you can imagine, because all I've been doing is making tea and you know, watching the podcast. <laughs> so, and we were let out the manor, and we confronted Tommy Elliott, um, that was the school bully that bashed him up, and I gave him his father's uh, wristwatch and told him to uh, sort him out. And um, I think that was a sort of germination, sort of uh, of the first time that you see the first elements of the growth, growth of Master Bruce becoming Batman, because it was the first time that he stood up for himself. And it was a very important moment, I think, for David and myself. And it was, uh, it felt great. It felt so. That was my favourite moment. Nice. My, my you, Oh yeah, we'll apply that. That's good. He needs more help with his ego. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I love you, Sean. Um, uh, the first one was uh, in with Saviano in the car when I shot him in the face. Yeah. Uh, that nice. was a great moment. Uh, and, but that was usurped by the, what I am very uh, selfishly calling the Butch Zuka scene. Where <laughs> and I come and sort out that Azrael. Um, and I said this yesterday, and I'll say it again for those who weren't there. One of my favorite moments in that scene is is Sean at the end of, of that scene, kind of awkwardly waving goodbye. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's my favorite. That'd be solid answer. <laughs> Do you want to give it a go? I've, I've been straining to think of one, but the only one that comes to mind is in season three, episode two, so I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> It's come really back next good. year, I'll talk about it. Nice, nice. Tease. Was that a firm commitment that you'll come back to Dragon Con next year? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wait, I can't think of one. Oh, I just thought of another one, my second favorite. <laughs> At the end of season two, when I got to run a car into Galvan slash Hasbro, oh, yeah. that was fun. I mean, I can't drive, I'm only 15. <laughs> I was in a stationary car. It was a lot of fun. Pretend to drive. <laughs> it was the closest I've ever gotten to driving. It's cool. Nice. <laughs> Our next question over here, Aaron. Yes, my question is for all of you. Where would you say you drew the most inspiration for each of your individual characters? 
Well, I, I drew mine actually from our sort of genius showrunners, really. I'd love to say it's down to us, but I think all of our cast will agree that you know, we feel that we get there on our own, but there's this sort of an extra sort of like driving hand that pushes in the direction they want us to go. So that's where a lot of the inspiration came from. But the thing is, what's happened now, now we've got to sort of season three, um, uh, the, 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 both Danny and, and John Stevens and Brynna Heller have been saying that they're following us and we thought that we were following them. So it's an interesting sort of dichotomy now because we, it's, a, it's a sort of a, it's a, a, a working process now, but we work together. So. That is a cool thing about season three. I think any, anybody that's put on a series can tell you there's an evolution um, to how it goes. You know, at first you, you're, everybody's new and you're trying to figure it out and it's trying to find its legs and figure out what the show is, both for the actors and for the writers and producers and, and crew. Uh, and then season two, you're kind of hitting your stride a little bit, you kind of feel it a little bit better. And now I think for season three, what we're finding is like we're all kind of hitting our stride and we can really, um, you know, it's like a car, you know, they say give it 5,000 miles before it really starts to get into the, the groove and that's kind of how it feels like for us. Like, I think things are just really in the pocket now and uh, hopefully we'll continue until, really we jump, until we jump the shark. <laughs> <laughs> With this show, who knows? No, uh, we're really fortunate because Jeff Johns is very involved in our show. He's the head of DC Comics and he, it's wow. us, he's, 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 he, uh, he signs off on all of the storylines and uh, when I first got the job, you know, I reached out to him and he, you know, he sent, he hand selected Penguin Comics and sent them to me. And those were incredibly helpful because they really went into uh, his background and, and sort of, and just the general psychology of the character, which would help me, it, I integrated that into the performance on the TV show. So that was a huge influence as well. So, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, a mixture of everything for me. I, I mean, I, as soon as I got the role, I watched every Batman movie I could. Mm -hmm. um, I got my hands on as many comics as I could, and I'm still doing that. I, no, major fan. But, um, and I kind of, I mean, I think most of the inspiration, like what John said, it was from the writers. I mean, the scripts were, the scripts were so clear in how they wanted us to portray the characters and what kinds of um, personalities they wanted us to bring to the role, and so, um, it really wasn't hard at all. The writers kind of did a lot of the work for us. Um, but also at the same time, I, I took as much inspiration from other incarnations of, previous incarnations of Batman and kind of integrated them um, in little bits as I could. But I think the majority of it came from, from the writers. I wanted to build on that question in that so, some, so many different great actors have played different incarnations of a lot of the roles that you represent, did you have to kind of find a new niche that hadn't been covered before so that you wouldn't be pigeonholed as a copycat or, oh, that's just like this? Or was there someone that you wanted to maybe emulate in stages or there bits and pieces from previous actors that have played those roles that you wanted? I think, I think our niche is that we're all playing these roles 10 years before anyone right. else has played them. I mean, I'm no, no other movie or TV show in live action has really gone this depth into Bruce Wayne's childhood and nobody's played um, Alfred before before there was a Batman and uh, you know same with Penguin and same with Lucius Fox and <laughs> <laughs> no one has ever played Butch <laughs> And no one ever will. <laughs> Suck it, Chelsea Riley. <laughs> Hi, um, my question's for David. Um, I think uh, earlier it was said that this is your first con, so welcome to that. And then uh, second, what does it really mean to you to kind of play a time period in Bruce Wayne's life that nobody's seen? Like, what does that really mean to you personally? Um, first of all, it's my first Dragon Con, and it's awesome, by the way. <laughs> you guys are like, Insane. San Diego on crack. Anyway, so, uh, I mean, what, what it means to me personally to be playing, um, uh, a young, a young Bruce Wayne, it's, I mean, when I, honestly, when I first got the role, I kind of, it was just 
you know, another job. I was going to have to go to New York, and it was, I was this pilot, and um, I, it was kind of all it was. And then it wasn't really until our first Comic Con in San Diego when the show hadn't even aired yet. We were filming our like second episode, and all that the public had seen before that is the trailer. Um, and there were these fans that were so so excited for the show, and I was like, okay, this is a big deal. Like these people were like dying to meet us and dying to get our autographs, and I was like, what if you don't like it? <laughs> you, you might hate it. <laughs> and a lot of you did at first. <laughs> um, and so you know, I was like, okay, you know, this this is this is a really big deal. And so then I kind of realized what I was getting into. Um, and but now that, that three years later, I'm a huge comic book fan. I'm I'm not just kid playing Bruce Wayne, that's not my only connection to Batman anymore. Now I'm a fan. And now I really, really care about the Batman mythos and, yeah. um, and what happens mm -hmm. inside of it. Um, it. It means everything to me to be playing a young Bruce Wayne, to be telling the story that's never been told before of, of the superhero that so many people find to be their favorite superhero and to be, I mean, for me, he's a symbol of, of justice and of what, you know, other forces of good can't do, Batman can. And I mean, it's, 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 it's the opportunity of a lifetime, really. Uh, how's it going? Um, my name is Garrett. This question is for David. Um, I read that you said that it'd be cool if a young Clark Kent got on Gotham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How would you foresee that being like played out if that actually happened? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about that, but I think it'll be great, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? right? I mean, I mean, here's the thing: in Batman vs Superman, they played it that Metropolis and Gotham are kind of twin cities, like like Oakland and San Francisco, just right? Like across the bay, and. If we if we play it like that on Gotham, I think it would be great just like for one episode to have like in one scene even to have like a Clark Kent in Gotham just just to, just that to be I would like a huge Easter egg that the fans would love and I would love to the fact just to the, alluding to the fact that Gotham is a part of a greater DC universe. Right, where the kids could be caught up in some kind of loan situation for the farm, <laughs> <laughs> and they had to come to the big fabulous city of Gotham and then give us some shady dealings. <laughs> With you know who. <laughs> and there's Clark sulking in the background going, I'll get you when I get bigger. <laughs> Steve, you heard it here first. I like it. Oh my god. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Hi, my question is um <clears throat> is for all of you. I was wondering, you know, when the promo pictures first came out, seeing which actors were playing which characters, my immediate thought was, nobody could be more perfect for so many of these characters. I can't wait to see how they play them. I was wondering and in those characters, what you, what you related to the most in your characters that you sort of found in yourself, and if you were maybe surprised to find yourself relating to the characters in ways that you didn't think you would. Yeah, I, I, jumping in, the, um, it was very important to me. I, I tried to stay away from as much of the text as I could just before we started shooting it. Of course, there's myself, Michael Caine and Michael Goff. But I'd, I'd read and I remembered from sort of the mythos and the canon of 76 years of this sort of history that when Alfred Penrith got involved in a tumble, got in a fight, that he never actually put a crease in his suit. You know, so and that was something that I was really intrigued by, and I and I know that, that I like the idea of sort of Alfred being sort of cosseted and everything like that. And working with um, the, the the wardrobe department at the time, that really sort of helped me. That was something that I was really surprised about, and surprised that the showrunners let Alfred be physical, and the fact that everything was so tailored, but I could move and fight in it. So that was a huge thing for me. So that was what I was surprised worked so well from an early standpoint. <laughs> nice. You always have the best answers. <laughs> it's like, yeah, now everybody follow that. <laughs> I would love to have seen, like how how like Jada played Fish. I that as a um, a young man that really likes um, alternative black styles, I feel that. Uh, <laughs> 
that Janie represents a community of performers. Of like her character was just so overarching and theatrical and over the top, and it was like every drag queen from coast to coast was like, I want to be her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, you know, from a friend. That was from a friend. I just, I just got the text telling me to say something about that. Yeah. <laughs> you would have been really great if you would have moderated this panel as Fish Booty. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Next year, it's a day. <laughs> that is the one thing about the show that's great. I mean, you know, there's a lot of great shows out there, but there's not many like Gotham that allow you to be uh, in this kind of world with the, you know, the, the colors, all the color bars turned up. That everything is a little bit bigger and a little bit bolder. The, the wardrobe we get to wear is incredible. The, mm -hmm. the cars are fun. The, the weaponry is great. You know, Tommy guns and Gatlin guns and bazookas and, you know, the, just the, the world that we get to live in um, is so much fun. And I, I don't, I try not to take that for granted. Because Law and Order is a great show. But you don't get to, you know, do the stuff that we get to do, you know? And so um, that, that, those don't come along very often. So I think we really appreciate that. Before we move to the next question, I wanted to give you guys like a, a thought when we wrap up at the end. If you were able to, for the upcoming season, a word that you think fans should, should take with them, just like a single word so that you're not revealing too much, give you some time to think about it. What do you think, guys? You think that would be cool? Yeah. And you can also just say no when it comes to your turn. <laughs> next question. Hi, guys. Love the show. My question is, if you could play any other character on the show, what would it be uh, and there why? It there it is. There, there it is. There it is. I think, right, that our cast is so sublime that I'd rather leave it as it is. And that, you know what I mean? I think that who could replace Robin? I wouldn't want to even go there. <laughs> our cast is so sublime that I think they're irreplaceable and I wouldn't dare go there. The fun, uh, uh, you, some of you may have heard this anecdote, but when we auditioned, we didn't, we weren't given a script, and we weren't given, we weren't told what characters we were, were auditioning with. I mean, at least that was for me and, and for Sean also, and maybe for well, a lot of us had that experience. And I, uh, the Danny and, and Bruno, Danny Cannon and Bruno Heller, our executive producers, uh, they were so brilliant in doing that because by doing that. They just wanted actors to come in who just naturally intuited the, the vision of their, these characters that they had. And so when I went in and I read, you know, I was given a scene, character's name was like Paul or something, and he was doing some penguin-y type stuff, but it wasn't, you know, explicitly a comic book. It was, you know, it was just, he's basically like shaking down some mobster dude. And so like, you know, and it's sort of out of nowhere. And so I just get in and went in and I was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna make my choices and interpret it as I see it. And then it turned out to be exactly spot on. So there's just something inherently inside of me that, that was perfect for what Danny and Bruno saw the character as. And the same with all of us up here, you know. Do, do what? The same. Do this. <laughs> Whatsoever. But, but in God, I mean. Desmond? But in Gotham, you care about him. And he's a terrible person. Most people for breakfast. Hello. But you like him. Oh, the person. And that's because of Robin. He's amazing.
Don't make it cry. Stop it. Aww. I think it's great that you had the opportunity to have Paul Rubens play the dad twice. Oh, no, right? That's so cool. I love those little nods to former incarnations of yeah, these characters. Totally. That was the first crossover between the films and the TV show was, was Paul Rubens, and he's just amazing. Person. Interesting word choice that you just said first and not only. <laughs> It's an interesting word choice that you said first crossover, not only crossover. Oh, well, you never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spoilers. Some people sweetie. coming in this season. Yeah. Next question. Hi. Um, this question was inspired by my interactions with Chris and Drew today. Um, yes. It is very apparent that your interactions with each other and your... I was handcuffed to you, Drew, if you don't remember. Hi. Um, oh, my. It was, uh, <laughs> with each other and your fans that Gotham brings you a lot of joy and I want to know how that joy from working on Gotham impacts you in your life offset. That's a great question. I don't think I've ever had that question of you because that's a really great question because the thing about what we do for a living is it does impact our life in a serious way. It's true for everybody to a certain extent, but for us, it's, you know, for a lot of us, this is a life-changing job. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we uh, it, it, and I've been in this business long enough to see people that have these great jobs on TV and they're miserable for whatever reason. Um, but I think genuinely for the majority of us, except for like one or two, and I won't tell yeah, you. Yeah, Marina, she's I'll, terrible. Yeah, I won't tell you. <laughs> she's a friend, she's a friend, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I didn't. And somehow someone's going to think that I said right. that Drew Powell, he's yeah, the worst. Yeah. It was a joke. But I think we all genuinely are, are so thrilled to be on the show because every actor wants to work. That's Everybody wants to do what they love. But then to do a job like this and then have these great people that we really enjoy hanging out with. And then the icing on the cake is to get to come to these things and have fans that give a shit about what we do. Sorry. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times people come up and say, just write your favorite line. I'm like, oh, I can't think of it. And then they come up with seven great options. I'm like, that's great. So it's, it's great on top of great on top of great. And, and it does affect our lives. And it, you know, for, for me anyway, it affects it for, for the better. And my son is funny because people now will, will see us in, in, in the street and say hello. And, and my son said, he's five. And he's like, Daddy, that's one of those people again? That's <laughs> <laughs> one of those people. Oh, my God, that's so, so sweet. sweet. I think uh, having come in into the second season, done a lot of shows in my day, a lot of great casts. What I was really happy about on the, I'm not answering your question, I'm answering my own question. Um, <laughs> rogue. That's what she wants. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a rogue. <laughs> and, uh, but what I was really happy about, you know, because I was a newbie coming in and I was, I, I get nervous. Like this group of people makes me nervous, it's too many people. Um, <laughs> But I walked in the room and everybody was so joyful, welcoming, and they were so happy about, everyone was saying, oh my God, the scripts are getting so much better. The characters are getting so much better. And as an actor, that's what you want. You want people who love their job, as, at least I do, as much as, I love my job so much. I, there's not a person that likes doing this more than me. And to walk into a room and be like, oh, but they're close. They really like doing this job was like a great thing. And so when you get to go and play in a room with these people, it's it's all joy, it's all support, it's all love. And that's, you get to take that home. Like I've worked on one show with a butthole and, <laughs> and, and it's, so, I mean, like if you work with that butthole, you just like, you go home and all you do, you do is like, oh. <laughs> Where does she go again? <laughs> and, and so, like, there's never been that moment on this on this set. So it's you just bring home all the love that they give you all day. Like when my, my dad died during the show, and I worked with Sean and 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 Donald, and we just sat there and we just started sharing these beautiful stories. And so it was like it's like a family, and that's you know having family at home and at work is ideal. <laughs> to take that question and, and twist it a bit in that is there anyone actor that you would all agree would be the one that when you arrive on set makes you come with your absolute best A game that like drives you to be the best actor you can be? I think Every, everyone does. Everyone does. Everyone I mean, does. I mean I, we, Robin and I, it's a true ensemble. I, mean, Robin I was going to say Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
obviously it's a strange thing because uh, you still get nervous on this show. It's because we actually we care so much about this. You don't want to be the guy that slips up, and we had an opportunity, both David and I and Robin, to work together. And I can't tell you how excited I was in Alfred meeting Penguin right. with Master Bruce in this club. And uh, I got I, I got really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I've got nervous. <clears throat> uh, I messed up my lines. That's because like, you care, you know. So. I can't tell you what the line was. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler, but, like, I said the stupidest thing. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was just so nervous because I was working for the first time. Yeah. The first time in three years. It's, so, yeah, it's insane. We were just sort of looking at each other being like, this is so <laughs> yeah. weird. Like, I know, like, it's like it's taking your best friend and then dressing them up in a weird outfit. And, well, who am I talking to? That's what we're doing. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Um, I have a question, I guess, like behind the scenes. I know you guys are talking about family. Well, have you guys ever done anything behind the scenes to you guys where it's like you guys hid someone's costume piece and then they're wondering, where did it go? And Ooh, have pranks. you guys done like tricks to each other or pranks? Uh, Corey, Michael Smith, and I pranked each other a couple of times at the beginning of the first season. And it was kind of like spurred on by one of, one of the production assistants. like. I think really was way into it more than Corey and I was. And so he was like trying to like facilitate this like fun little prank where we we like it was just like innocent things where like Corey left all this like like weird like like he dripped like fake blood all over my dressing table, like in my dressing room. And, like and I sent him like a funeral arrangement and like we were just doing like <laughs> silly crap like that. And then oh, it got really dark. But I think that's why that's why it kinda of, that's why it kinda of ended, because at that point then Corey and I actually started working more together. We had that scene in the first season and I realized how much I truly love him as a person and he's become one of my very close friends. So then we were like, can we just stop this bullcrap? I mean, this is like so exhausting. You know, it's like, because initially I think we were both like, oh, if we play pranks, we're gonna have fun little stuff to talk about at panels like this. And then we were just like, let's just be friends and work together. <laughs> like, we're all friends, um, yeah. We get that question a lot and I, I, I'm always surprised that we, we don't. I mean, like, surely we've been pranking each other, right? But we don't. I, we, we just have a good time. We, we do stupid stuff um, with each other, but it's usually not at each other, I guess. Right. You know, there's not that thing. I mean, I was on Leverage, and we, you know, somebody stuck cold cuts down somebody else's pants. I mean, you know, <laughs> so there's those kind of things happen, but I'm not sure we're, that's, that's a long story. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think, Oh. Well, I just think as fans, it's awesome when we catch those blooper reel moments. So, and they're always just full of energy, and of course they're pieced together so amazingly. You're like, that must be what happens every day on set. Well, there's plenty of blooper reel stuff. I mean, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. I mean, we have a good time, but it's not as much in the prank world. Gotcha. The blooper reel from the first season, I don't know if you guys got the DVD, but it's so funny because it's literally, the blooper reel is just like, beep, beep, beep. <laughs> it's really just like, <laughs> Just like this panel. Awesome. <laughs> Beep. Next question. If Harley Quinn would be added into the show, do you think Ooh. there would be any siding to her future self? So Harley Quinn, if she was introduced. Would, it, would, would there be any way? If there any foreshadowing of foreshadowing, like yeah. A young Harleen Quinzel. I mean, I would imagine so. It's, I, it's always hard with our show in the sense that, like, <laughs> you know, we're doing different things with people's ages, and you know what I mean? Like, and Harley Quinn, as far as I'm concerned, is probably in her mid-twenties or earlier, like, in terms of the character, I, I don't know, some people... She's a doctor, so I'd imagine she has to be of an age to have been able to go oh, she's through... she's a doctor, oh, okay. Yeah, she's a psychiatrist. Okay, so she'd be in her... Th yeah, that, that takes a minute, I guess. She's a messed up doctor, <laughs> I'm so glad that you mentioned something about ages because it seems that for the upcoming season there might be a very young actress who isn't so young anymore mm -hmm. that might yes. be playing Quiz Night. Yes, it is. So is that explained in a way that will make us go, okay, that's an interesting, like, like I have a theory. <laughs> go with me on this journey. Go for it. <laughs> 
do it. That one of those that have escaped from the bus at the end of season two, like one of the, the, the mutants or whatever that has special powers, maybe have done something to her to accelerate her age. We're not allowed to say. Guys, I tried. Firm or deny. Firm or deny. Okay. I just thought that was interesting, and that's my theory. Mm, that that's an interesting theory. theory. That is indeed a theory. <laughs> Have you any others? <laughs> uh, I will say, this kind of segues to another another part um, with, uh, with the cast. With, you know, uh, Claire Foley played uh, the young Poison Ivy in a beautifully creepy way. Um, and now we've got Maggie, uh, uh, who is, you know, awesome. Um, but the one weird thing about it, when, when characters leave or actors leave, we get so close to them that when, you know, somebody dies, you know, it's really sad. Like we're, you know, there's not a lot of acting there. If somebody goes away, you know, we really miss them. Um, and uh, that's the hard part about being on a show. Luckily, you know, we, we're not, at least so far, a Game of Thrones, everyone's gonna die show. <laughs> but also when people die on Gotham, they just come back to life two episodes later. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, so. it's not permanent, it's a good game. Yeah, Jim. <laughs> well, next question. There are none. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really, really nervous. Um, I'll be nervous. <laughs> also, really quick, Robin, hi. My dad and my friend told me to tell you that they love you. Oh, I love them too. Send my love, please. <laughs> and my, my question is for everybody. Um, I know you're all very close, and um, I was wondering if you're off like when you're not on screen, those relationships that you have with those people, do those affect your characters? Or do they affect your performance with the different characters that you interact with? That's a good question. Good question. <laughs> well, no, not, not really, because it's strange. I mean, I spend most of my time with Master Bruce, with, with David, and it's uh, amazing how we sort of sort of segue, slip into to our, our particular roles, but we goof around and talk, and um, I spend more time probably with Dibi than my own son, really, and it's so, it's, it's quite sad, really, but, <clears throat> but, but no, but we, we, we spend a lot of time together as friends, and that's the thing, but we're on set, and we, you know, we're, one of the other great things about our show is that we actually shoot it in eight and a half days, and the, the sheer sort of operatic scale of it, we don't have a great deal of time, so we do take it very seriously, and everyone has to bring their, as Chris was saying early on, you have to have your game face. You don't want to be the one to slip up and fall on your flat on your face. So, so when we play, we play hard, and when we work, we work very hard. Yeah. Yeah. Similar with me. I mean, I I uh, have a lot of I mean, great scenes with Drew Powell, who's you know, as we all know, like a lovable teddy bear of a person, <laughs> and it's really it's become a very very good friend of mine. But then I go on set and I treat him like crap. And then I chop off his hand. And then I'm like, no, 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 it's like awful. But then we like, it's like rap and it's like, yeah. get on yeah, you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Then I jump in his arms and cuddle. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> do it. I mean, we, at the end of the day, we're professional. <laughs> professionals, and so we gotta do our job. <laughs> And so, you know, we'll jump and cuddle after, and when we're on, we'll do our job. This is the best panel ever. <laughs> All this love and cuddles. <laughs> Next question. My question is for Robin. Yeah. You have an amazing interpretation of Penguin, and Thank I was you. wondering how you do his walk. Oh, I, I'm not going to demonstrate it, so I apologize. But you can find it online somewhere. But I, uh, but yeah, well, thank you so much. And I, and I, I, I can't take all of the credit. The credit, really, I share with Danny Cannon and Bruno Heller and John Stevens. They, they, it's really, it starts with them, and then I just sort of show up. But um, but but, but yeah. So like in terms of the walk, like the the long and the short of it is that I, uh, I, you know, it's an actual. Uh, an injury that he receives from Fish Mooney in the first episode, and so I did, you know, I asked around to, to ask, you know, to see, like, you know, what would this look like if it didn't heal properly, and I talked to our stunt coordinator and, you know, some other folks, and then they gave me ideas, I practiced for about a week, and then I showed up, like I said before, that, that pier scene uh, in the pilot with Jim Gordon, and our director, who was Danny Cannon, one of our producers was directing that episode, he was like, all right, show me what you got, and I did it, and he was like, 10% less, 
Okay. Okay. So like, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, one, two, three. <laughs> but then I saw it, I did that, and then he was like, perfect, and then that's what you see. And I did, I do, for, well, for a season and a half, I, I, I had a water bottle cap in my right shoe. Uh, because there was one day when I forgot to do the limp and no one caught it and I felt like the worst actor in the world. And so, so from then on, yeah, and now, but since then I've downgraded to uh, two quarters stacked on top of each other. Yes. Because I'm, I'm a wimp. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so that's where the walk came about. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great question. But, but, um, how physical does, does it hurt after walking differently than your normal gait? I mean, how was it the recovery time of like, wow, those are muscles that don't like to be used quite that way? It's true. Like I, yeah. Well, it's interesting because I because I end up overcompensating and spending most of my time on the good leg, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's the one that actually feels more pain after a while. So I'll be like doing yoga and I'm completely lopsided at one point. Like one leg will go up like this, and the other leg will be like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, but it's like after a while, it's, it's, it's working out. <laughs> How did that other leg go? Did that other leg go again? Hello. <laughs> so worth it. Next question. Hi, this question's for Robin and David. Um, it's kind of about the body transformation stuff we talked about earlier with with. Uh, Robin, your work I think is fantastic as the, as the uh, as the penguin, and you do the limp really well even when you forget to do it. <laughs> uh, do you foresee the script that comes in that says, "Hey, Robin, this weekend gain a hundred pounds and get a monocle"? <laughs> and uh, and uh, David, same kind of question. I mean, you're you're a very young Bruce Wayne, but. Uh, how about that script that says go home and put on 100 pounds of muscle <laughs> to be Bruce Wayne, or to be Batman? Um, well, I actually have started training with the trainer this year, um, to work towards that, obviously. Um, so not just this weekend? <laughs> started on Friday. <laughs> what if that was yesterday? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, no, yeah, and... Uh, I mean, the, for, for me at least, the writers haven't really um, talked to me about that. I think, I mean, I think in their minds, and in, you know, realistically, I'm 15, I think Bruce is around 15. I don't think he becomes Batman until he's 25, maybe, maybe a little bit younger, but I think around 25. And, um, and so there, there's, there's time to get there. It doesn't have to happen, you know, now. Um, it's, it's, it's an evolution, just like it is psychologically. Um, it is physically also, and you're going to slowly start to see that build, and I think with Penguin they'll probably do that um, later on also, but I mean, I mean, I really don't know. It's, I think it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a question for the writers. Yeah, they... When, when they're planning on making that transformation. They, they like, like to be said, yeah, they haven't said anything to me either, but they do make amazing bat suits. You would not believe what they could do with some latex and silicone. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no Danny DeVito for you in the future then? What's that? No Danny DeVito look for you in the future. Danny DeVito. Well, I'm saying I could look like Danny DeVito, it just doesn't have to be real. <laughs> I can serve some Danny DeVito, okay? Great question. I think we all look like Danny DeVito in our hearts. Yes. Um, true. Hey, so, true. That guy kind of janked my question. Can you all see me? Yeah. yeah? Like cool. How many fingers am I holding up? Two. Oh, yeah, he's over there. Yeah. So, David, baby Bruce may not know that he's going to become the bat, but would you do us all a favor and give us your best notorious, I'm Batman? <laughs> Totally will. It's totally gonna crack right now. <laughs> Puberty sucks. <laughs> Are you guys ready?
about the evolution of Penguin. We ever see him, will we ever see him wear his monocle and his top hat and smoke a cigar? Well, I hope so. I, I mean, the, and it's gonna be interesting because like, like again, with, with, the, walk, with the, the walk and the, the, the limp, as it were, uh, the fact that we incorporated it into this storyline as an actual injury, and then I know that in the, in the comic books, the monocle is also the result of an injury. Uh, and I think like all of those like pieces coming together are what's really exciting about the show. So I think definitely, and the, the writers know that. I mean, like that's the joy of doing the prequel is that we can drop little, you know, like character mannerisms or, or uh, you know, just little, you know, ideas about the character that we all recognize. Uh, we can drop them as we go along. So hopefully that will happen. Um, in terms of smoking a cigar, though, that will never happen because Fox doesn't allow smoking on screen. And it's really interesting because it's like, right on. Um, we, I had a scene in the first season with, uh, with uh, F uh, Don Falcone, where, I, where it's, it's actually episode seven, where I re reveal that I've been working for him the whole time. And in the script, we're supposed to be holding cigars, smoking cigars. So we show up, they, John Dillman, who's an amazing actor who plays Falcone, they, you know, they give him a cigar right away, and then they're like, they're like, we cut your cigar, and I'm like, Great. And so, but then with John, like, there were, like, we had someone from Standards and Practices come over and was like, okay, here's the deal. You can't take a drag on it in camera. You also can't hold it next to your face in the same shot, but you, if you pull it down, then you can exhale smoke, but they can't see the smoke in the exhale of the cigar. And it's like the most insane thing. And like, it was just driving the director crazy, because he was like, no, they can't smoke cigars? What is this? Like, you know, like, China or something, you know, he's like going on. He's Donald Trump directed that episode, by the way. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, it's really interesting. So the smoking is not gonna happen, but yeah, anyway. But you just you might see a cigar in one hand and then smoke in the next frame. And yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. You could see that, but yeah. Anyway. You had all mentioned uh, so many of the great scenes you've had with actors in the show, whether they're coming in as day players and they're not around for, for long because they come and do their thing and move on. Is there anyone that you're looking forward to having a scene with that maybe you've not had the chance to have that, just that great dialogue yet that you're just like, ooh, next script, maybe it's in that one? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm lucky enough to have virtually worked in some capacity with everyone. I worked with Robin the other day, I told you earlier on. Um, but uh, I, I'd love to do a scene. I, I sort of glowered at uh, Corey, Michael Smith, who plays Enigma, absolutely brilliantly. So great. Right. Yeah. It's absolutely phenomenal. So I sort of glared at him once, but I'd like to talk to him at some point, firmly. Firmly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, who would I, who is I uh, not? I haven't had a lot of stuff with Lucius, which would be really nice. And, and not even enough stuff with these two guys. I mean, like, that's, that's really what I look forward to more, is just, yeah, more character interaction. Especially, like, there, there tends to be a, you know, as we go along, you know, you can find, kind of find the show, you know, part of it is in with the villains, and the other part is with the heroes. But what I look forward to, and I know that we're going there, is, you know, the ultimate story about how Gotham City corrupts everyone. And so having interaction and dealings with Alfred and David, who obviously, and Lucius, who are all you know, on the hero side, you know, I think makes it a more compelling show. So mm -hmm. I know that Agreed. that's coming down the road. Yeah, I mean, thinking. everyone has a propensity for good or evil in our show. It's a tightrope, really. So that's the fun stuff. I've said this before, but I, I, I mean it more and more every time I say it. I want a scene where Butch and Bruce are in a car going on a journey together. It's a road trip. Road trip. Road trip across Gotham. Season seven. <laughs> yes. Butch becomes a driving instructor. <laughs> Just made the way of this. Teaches Bruce how to drive. <laughs> it's perfect. It's gold, baby. It's gold. It's 
Time for one more question before we end the panel with that one word thought that I want you to live, live, oh, yes. leave for season three. Hi, oh. my name so cute. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Haley. Uh, I was wondering if you guys were like any of you working on any other projects than Gotham. That'll soon be. Ooh. Yeah. I, thought I am. What's up, Chris? What you working on? Oh, I'm working on a little. Uh, well, I'm I'm on. A, I'm a recurring guest star on the show Underground on WGM, which you should all watch. I'll let you boy. And uh, I'm so dumb. And uh, and also, there's a film. There's actually a short called Four Pounds of Flowers that's doing the festival circuit right now. And then there's a film called Come and Find Me with me, Aaron Paul, Garrett Dillahunt, and some others. So go see it. I, um, I have a movie, horror movie. Anybody who likes to get scared? Yeah. Um, coming out December 2nd with Aaron Eckert. Mm -hmm. And it was directed by the guy who directed San Andreas and Journey 2, Brad Payton. He's great. Um, I was like, two years, three years younger than I am now, so you probably won't recognize me. I did something really weird with my hair. But yeah, you should guys, I'm, I'm possessed in it. It's nice. nice. No, it's not curly at all, because my, my hair naturally then was super curly, but they flat ironed it down. <laughs> and so it just looks kind of weird. <laughs> but it fits the role perfectly, because I'm, I'm possessed, so, you know, I'm like a demon. That's so bad hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but if you, yeah, uh, yeah, I saw it for the first time a couple weeks ago, and it's great. So I think you guys, um, if you if you like horror movies, definitely go see it. December second. Oh, I didn't say the name. Oh, it's called Incarnate. Incarnate. Yes. And figure it out. I want you guys to figure it out. Do your research. Um. I shot a film not uh, the year before with uh, directed by James Franco and with Josh Hutcherson and uh, Courtney Love and it's really amazing. And oh, wow. James is also in it uh, called The Long Home, which is hitting the festival circuit now. So hopefully, you know, it'll be out there at some point. Um, and then I also did I did one of the really amazing job that I had was uh, I did the voice of he's basically the narrator of Dishonored Two. I don't know. It's, it's a really amazing game. Uh, and and honestly, like. Going, uh, Dishonored is an amazing game in and of itself, but two is uh, it's gonna blow your minds. Like the amount, like the different paths you can take on it, it seems like limitless. So it's yeah, check it out. Thanks. Okay. No, I, I actually in my eyes it's always the beach, you know. I mean? yeah, but I, I did, uh, <laughs> his project was working on his tan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He did a good job. I do, I do a series called uh, Master Chef. It's not the same Master Chef you have here. And I do lots of voiceovers in my country. I do lots of computer games as well. I do voices for computer games. And animation, and I do this series down the line to to London called Master Chef the Professionals and things like that. But no, that's it. Sean, um, you mispronounced Doctor Who. Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> the legacy. Uh, I, uh, there's a movie called Geostorm with Gerard Butler that's coming out someday. Uh, oh, maybe it's not that late. Yeah, <laughs> we looked a lot alike. Mm -hmm. um, I got confused all the time. But and, and there's a couple other things. But I, uh, I have this web series that I shot with my buddies. Literally, we have a garage band in, in LA. I have for years, and we decided to make this silly web series called Man Jam. And uh, it's about a bunch of uh, middle-aged guys that have a rock band, and suddenly they get to do it. Uh, we just shot. Uh, five, like six, five minute episodes, and uh, we're hoping to do some more. But uh, it's manjamtheseries.com, not manjam.com. That's something. <laughs> <laughs> so Be careful. I was so interested. Go, go check that out too. If you're <laughs> a different note, not that one. Um, I know we can find you guys immediately after this panel, two floors down in the Walk of Fame, right? You guys are gonna hang out yes. down there for a little bit? Yep. Awesome. Please so, come. one word, Let's exit. See. Drew, we'll go back down the opposite way. I'll start with you. One word, dude. That's it. Uh, 
I should have been thinking about this for like you gave me half an hour. I gave you 30 minutes. Half an hour. Uh, one word that's going to describe season three. For viewers that they just have to, to grasp onto for your character. For my character. Um, <laughs> torn. Torn. Nice. <laughs> Allegiances. Allegiances. Ooh. Now you got to top that. <laughs> <laughs> Here again with the mic drop. <laughs> I've never seen this to kill Uh, uh, wait for me. Uh, <sighs> what's not too much of a spoiler? Uh, romance. <gasps> Yeah.